Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's lecture is entitled Maxillary Skeletal Expansion using MARPI. This was a lecture by Akram al Hawazi. This was a really nice lecture. Akram focused on the clinical side of MARPI. Where does it fit in with our other expansion appliances? He also then went on to describe his clinical experiences, failures and successes. He touched on MSC or Maxillary Skeletal Expansion and the difference with that and MARPI. He finally concluded with clinical tips as how he uses the appliance itself. This lecture is fully available from Akram's YouTube channel, uh, which Akram has other lectures on as well from experts around the world, a great resource. To recap, the podcast is the interpretation of myself and the orthodontics and summary team and may not be 100% accurate, although we try our best to try and achieve it. Akram began by describing the main purposes of expansion within orthodontics. The main one, to correct functional crossbites also to create space within the arch, to carry out pre-functional correction, but also to widen patient smiles. Now, there are two main categories of expansion appliances within orthodontics, that of our tipping appliances, the removable appliance and quad helix, and our skeletal expanders on the other side, our RME appliances or rapid maxillary expanders, or our surgically assisted rapid palatal expanders, our SARPI. Now, where does MARP fit into this when it's miniscule assisted rapid mild maxillary expansion? Well, the key idea is that in the skeletal category, there are challenges. When we start talking about RME, there's a restriction as to which age it will be useful for. After a young age, it no longer works successfully or reliably. When it comes to the use of SARP or surgically assisted expansion, it's quite an invasive ap approach to take place. So MARPI positions itself between these two in the skeletal group. Yes, it achieves skeletal expansion and bodily movement. It's less complex than SARPI, but there's a wider age group applicable to it than RME itself. The next aspect of the lecture focused on Akram's clinical cases. And he very bravely and boldly described his first MARPI case, which was a failure. So he went to a Peter 9 lecture at the Arab conference and did his first case in 2019. He used an approach where he had four palatal tads placed with no arms and he failed to get any expansion taking place. He reflected on this and described how the failure occurred. He had tads which became mobile, one got embedded in the palatal mucosa and there was no significant expansion. He looked at what caused this and he described how the positioning of his expansion screw was too posterior. Now, the further posterior we go, the greater resistance there is to expansion. It's closer to Batarugo palatine suture, but also the zygomatic buttress, which increases the resistance and needs more force to be able to break it. Next, he had no guiding arms to it. So though he had four tads, there was greater risk of rotation taking place off the appliance itself. Finally, he looked at his tads and his design of the appliance. So he used short tads, and ideally for the amount of force required for MRP, bicortical engagement is ideal. There was also play in between how the expander was attached to the tads. This meant that high forces weren't transmitted ideally to the tads and caused some play to take place. So, so Akram tried again, and he used the issues with his first case to help steer him in his second design. So in his next Marpi case, he used two tads, which were longer, 12 millimeters, to get bicortical engagement. The screw itself was positioned more anteriorly, and he used guiding arms to help him position the, the screw, but also to ensure a rotational effect was less likely to occur. He had better precision fit between the screw itself and the tads. He had also a younger patient, which was favorable, and a female patient at that. And he achieved successful palatal expansion in the second case. Next, Akram went on to describe the differences between miniscrew assisted rapid palatal expansion, MARPI, versus MSC, maxillary skeletal expansion. Now, these two terminologies sound relatively similar, but they come from different directions. So, Prof Moon is the chap who's proposed MSC, and the process works differently. The screw is purposefully positioned more posteriorly, and the premise of this is, is that there's four tads which are used. And we've already spoken about it being closer to sites of resistance. So there's greater force required to be able to achieve expansion in this process. The premise that Professor Moon puts forwards is that by having the screw more posterior, we achieve more parallel expansion and less pyramidal expansion, both anteriorly and posteriorly. 
To account for this, there needs to be greater force activation taking place, the use of longer TADs, and it has to be in the vault of the pallet, not in the lateral walls, to achieve a successful outcome. Now, the, the development of MSC has gone through some iterations. So Sean Ellis described MSC1 and MSC2. Now, I thought this was an interesting development in the product and it's worth sharing. So when it comes to MSC1, it was simply the same as a RME appliance, it used a Hyrax screw. One of the issues were that the key would bend as it was activated. Now, the MSC2, the con new connotation of it, is, is a proposal using a wrench screw or a hexagonal screw. This has some significant advantages. The first is that each activation is of a lesser order. Rather than being 0.25 millimeters as per Hyrax screw, this time we're looking at 0.13 millimeters of activation. The advantages here is that great activation can take place, but incrementally. So, when we describe the activation when it comes to using MSC2, we're looking at the patients turning this key at least four to six times in the day and achieving close to 0.5 to 0.9 millimeters of expansion per day. The final component to Akram's lecture was describing clinical tips. In constructing the appliance, he suggested having the screw positioned as close to the palatal mucosa as possible. When it comes to the arms, ensuring two millimeters of clearance of the palatal mucosa. When Akram positions the screw, the tads themselves, he likes to use a handpiece for half the insertion for efficiency. But actually for the final half of insertion, he uses a hand appliance, either a hand screwdriver or a ratchet. This is to have good tactile feedback, so he knows when cortical engagement has taken place. And finally, he's looking for the endpoint. How do we know we've got cortical engagement? We can also ask the patient. If they feel a tingling sensation through their nasal mucosa, then we have bicortical engagement. I think this topic of MARPI is a really interesting and exciting new innovation within orthodontics. In, a, in, in the next podcast, I'll also be looking at Bjorn Ludwig's lecture, looking at MARPI as well, to get some other perspectives on this topic. I suggest having a look at Kevin O'Brien's guest blog by Benedict Wilms, which took place last month, looking at the topic as well. As always, please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.